Aloha, my name is Mariah Mossman, and I'm the Program Manager for Stroke Care at Maui Memorial Medical Center. Thank you so much for joining me for our fifth annual, but first, Virtual Stroke Awareness Fair. I have the privilege of being joined by some of my colleagues from Maui Health. I'll be talking with neurologist Dr. Cordia Wan, cardiologist Dr. Kimball Poon, and physical therapist Caitlin Reese. We'll also have a special appearance by Chef Leslie Barayuga and others from Kula Hospital. May is National Stroke Awareness Month, and we'll be talking about the signs and symptoms of stroke, risk factors, and prevention. We have a lot of great information and opportunities for you to join in and move along with us. If you pre-registered for the event, you should have received a package in the mail. You may want to get those exercise bands ready for later when Caitlin joins me. Caitlin and a special guest from Debrata's will be teaching us some new exercise moves. It's sure to be fun and entertaining. You're going to want to join in. I would like to thank Maui Health for giving us this opportunity to share with our community. You know, 80% of strokes can be prevented, and on average, we get around one patient a day at the hospital who has suffered a stroke. Maui Memorial Medical Center is a primary stroke center accredited by the Joint Commission. We're also awarded by the American Heart Association with the Get With the Guidelines Stroke Gold Plus with Honor Roll Elite Award. By participating in these programs, we've made a commitment to treat our patients with the most up-to-date, evidence-based treatment. Following these guidelines improves patient care and outcomes for the community. I'm really proud to be a part of this program and the team of people that it takes to come together and provide care. This program helps us keep our stroke patients on Maui because we can provide treatment for stroke, whether it be a clot-busting medication or a surgical procedure. These treatments are very time sensitive though, and, if there, is a spe and there is a specific time frame in which they can be given. So it's very important that you know how to recognize a stroke and call 911 as soon as symptoms are recognized. We use the acronym BFAST to remember the symptoms. Last year, I was able to recruit some of our very own Maui Keiki to help teach us how to be fast. Take a look. COVID has changed our daily lives, but don't let it change the way that you respond to an emergency. Stroke is always an emergency. Don't drop the ball and always be fast when someone is having a stroke. B is for balance. E is for eyes. F is for facial drink. A is for arm weakness. S is for speech. T is for time. Time to call 911. A stroke happens when a clot or a rupture stops blood from getting to your brain. If you see someone with loss of balance, Chosey. A droopy face, arm or leg weakness, or difficulty speaking or thinking clearly. Don't drop the ball. Call 911 fast. Be fast. Be fast. Be fast. Be fast. Be fast. I hope you all have an idea now on how to be fast. Joining me now is neurology specialist, Dr. Cordia Wan. Since we're both vaccinated, as well as all of my other guests that will be here today, and we're more than two weeks away from our last vaccination, we'll be talking without masks. We still take precautions like wearing our masks in public and are screened every day for work. Um, if you haven't been vaccinated yet and want to do so, Maui Memorial is now offering vaccines for ages 12 and up. Thank you, Dr. Wan, for being here. Thanks for having me tonight, Mariah. I appreciate it. Dr. Wan completed medical school at UC San Diego and residency training at Kaiser Permanente in Los Angeles. Her practice philosophy is to treat every patient as a family member. This doesn't mean that you can ask her for money if she's your doctor, though, not that kind of family member. But she really does treat her patients with genuine care and compassion. Her goal is to enhance stroke health through education and outreach to all residents, which is attainable given our smaller community size and geography. Thank you so much for being with us. So we just watched this video about Be Fast, and I know we can't really, we really want people to understand the signs and symptoms of stroke. So can you just kind of go over Be Fast again? Sure. Wasn't that a great video, though? It was. I love all that the kids fun. in it. Yeah. So, you know, Be Fast is an acronym, right? And it's really meant to help everybody remember the signs and symptoms of stroke so that you can 
be fast and call 911, and hence the be fast. The fast part is really about calling 911. So, so B is standing for the symptom balance. So oftentimes in, in people with stroke, they can present with imbalance. And that can be, you know, oftentimes is when people are walking around and they feel like they're falling left or they're falling right, and they just feel like there's like a drunk feeling. They're just mm -hmm. weaving back and forth, and that's the kind of imbalance we tend to see. E um, for eye or eyesight. Um, so stroke sometimes can affect a vision and the symptoms can range from a double vision or blurry vision or losing vision in one eye or having a big blind spot. So that's what the E stands for. Um, F is for face. Um, sometimes we can see a facial droop or people can feel like numbness on one side of the face. Um, A is for arm or leg. Uh, we can see weakness in the arm or the leg or numbness in the arm or a leg. Um, S is for speech, so speech problems like having slur speech or not being able to come up with the right words or right. stuttering or not being able to understand speech, that's all symptoms of stroke. And uh, T is for time, okay, and that's time to call 911. And so, um, you know, sometimes the symptoms aren't that obvious, right. right? Yeah. And so, like, anytime you notice a big difference in your body, um, suddenly it really is the time to call 911. And so often we'd see somebody who comes in after days of having trouble with walking, right. having to hold onto the walls to walk at home. And it can be mild, but it's sudden and it's different, right? right? Yeah, and that's the thing with stroke, is always a sudden change. Right. So the real big thing to watch out for is suddenly there's something different with your body then that can potentially be a stroke. So with that sudden change, is it okay if somebody drives their family member in? Like what's the difference between driving in and calling 911? Yeah. So um, our stroke treatments are all time sensitive and so the key is to get to the hospital as soon as possible, which is why we encourage people to call 911. And actually the um, the whole process for treating somebody with, with a stroke starts from the time we get our 911 call, mm -hmm. yeah, because our hospital works with the um, ambulance center so that when the paramedics gets to your home or wherever you are that the symptoms start, they actually start doing tests and assessing you and then calling calling the, the patient into the emergency room so that our stroke team is on standby when right. when the car when the ambulance arrives, so the ambulance, the doctor is going to meet you at the back door versus you come into the lobby. It may not be as as fast. Yeah, right? and you know it takes time to drive from wherever you may be driving from. Ambulance shortens that time. Um, while in the ambulance, the paramedics are already doing blood tests that we need for part of our treatments and strokes. So right. all of that cuts time. And in stroke treatment, time is the key. Time is brain. The faster you can get the treatment, the more brain we can save. Right. And what about causes of stroke? Like, what do people need to look for? What are risk factors? Who should be kind of aware that they could have a stroke? Yeah. So, you know, strokes can actually happen to anybody at right. any age. So even if you're a perfectly healthy person in your 20s and 30s, if you get suddenly a change like that in your body, it can still be a stroke and you should still call 911. The most uh, common risk factors for, for stroke um, are actually these five things. Um, one is hypertension or high blood pressure. Um, two is cholesterol, high cholesterol. Three is um, diabetes. And then four is smoking. Five is uh, obesity. So all of these five risk factors uh, impacts our body's blood vessels, um, including the ones that go to the brain and hence increasing the risk for stroke. Right. So people who have these risk factors should be paying particular attention to, to these stroke symptoms because they are at risk for stroke. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a stroke, but you know that you're at risk, so you really want to take care of yourself and, and well, ways yeah, to prevent it. Well, yeah, it doesn't necessarily it. mean you will have a stroke. Um, those are risk factors for stroke, right. so there's a potential. And, you know, the reason why we have want to identify these risk factors here tonight is because there are things you can do about it, right? right? Yeah. There are steps that you can take. So if somebody has some of these risk factors and, you know, we're kind of all creatures of habit, like what's, 
What's well, some easy steps that we can take to make some changes, some healthy changes? Yeah, sure. So, um, well, I just want to say, so those three risk factors at the beginning, the diabetes, hypertension, and cholesterol, you know, those are really things that are picked up by your primary doctor when you when you see them at checkup. So you want to make sure that you see your doctors regularly to get tested for these risk factors because yes. they don't hurt, right? Right. Um, obesity, smoking, those are lifestyle changes that, that can be done. Right. Yeah. So if you're a smoker, you want to quit smoking. And if you're you know, obese, then you want to take steps to lose weight and keep a healthy diet. Right. So thank you so much, Dr. Wan, for all of this great information. If anyone has questions, she'll be hanging out until the end for a live Q&A along with our other upcoming guests. So you've talked about BFAS, we talked about risk factors, we talked about changes that you could take. And so really some of the changes that um, can help reduce the risk factors for stroke have to do with diet and exercise, right? right? Yeah. So we talked with Chef Leslie Barayuga from Kula Hospital, and he taught us how to make a healthy meal. Um, so we're gonna, we went up to, to visit with him at Kula Hospital, and also talked with Kalamanu Endo, one of their nutrition assistants, who talked about the benefits of knowing what's in your food, and so it's really good to know what you, what's in your food and helps you understand the content. If you pre-registered, you'll find the recipe card for this in the packet. So here's Chef Leslie and Kalamanu. Aloha, my name is Mariah Mossman. I'm the program manager for the stroke program at Maui Memorial Medical Center. Today we're here in Kula Maui at Kula Hospital with Chef Leslie Barayuga. And he's gonna be teaching us about how to cook a healthy meal at home. I'm preparing um, for you guys today a pan seared Atlantic salmon with a, a boiled potatoes, wilted spinach, and a tomato basil vinegar uh, salsa. All right, so first thing we do is um, we grab the potatoes. This is, uh, you can either use uh, Yukon gold potatoes or white potatoes. Um, just quarter the potato. Put in bo um, boiling water. Um, you can add, um, add some herbs, a uh, couple of sprigs of thyme, uh, one sprig of basil, and maybe just two, two crushed garlic cloves. Um, this will at least uh, flavor the potatoes and um, make it aromatic. Uh, next one, this is, this is the balsamic reduction, the balsamic glaze for the fish. Uh, what you do is basically take a cup of balsamic vinegar, um, you boil it, and it, it'll take about maybe 20, 25 minutes to reduce. You reduce it down by half, and that should be that should make the balsamic reduction. Once the balsamic reduction is done, I have the final product here, which which would look like this. It'll be like a honey consistency, honey-like consistency, and it'll be like a sweet tart flavor, basically. Now let's get to the salmon. And while the potato is boiling, you can do the salmon. That is aromatic. It smells yeah. really good. Um, so what I do is I, I, I season it with um, peppercorns, fresh ground peppercorns, and I season it with celery salt. Just lightly season it. Celery salt is basically um, celery, uh, ground, uh, ground celery seed uh, mixed with salt, so it's uh, pretty low in sodium. It's a little more flavorful too, since yes. it's a celery salt. Yeah. And that's important, right, when we think about brain health and heart health, that we want to have a lower sodium diet. Yeah. Yeah. It's better for our, our blood pressure. So you get a saute pan, fry pan, whatever you have. Not doesn't have to be nonstick. Some olive oil. I use olive oil. Olive oil is um, a lot more healthier than butter or the other. Uh, fatty oils that you can use. And just let it let it cook probably five five minutes each side. So while the while the potato is boiling and the salmon is searing on a pan, we can go ahead and make our uh, tomato basil salsa. Basically you just give one tomato, you can slice some 
dash the tomatoes in quarter inch pieces. Grab your red onion. So this is a salsa that you're going to be putting on top of the... On the fish, on the on salmon. The Dice the onions. Grab some fresh basil leaves. And just chop it up. Half, half a lime. Squeeze. And a little bit of black pepper, olive oil, and that should make the sauce right there. So I know we talked about uh, we wanted to eat something healthy about using fresh fruits and fresh vegetables, and so this is lots of fresh vegetables right there. Yeah, this is um, readily available in your local supermarket, so it shouldn't be too hard to find. And I know I tried to do my own garden this this past time that we've been home for long lengths of time and I actually was able to grow some tomatoes and some basil so it'd be <laughs> great to be able to use that for my garden. Um, what about if you don't have fresh fresh herbs? Is it okay to use? Yeah, it's okay to use um, dry, dry, ba uh, dry herbs if you want to. Okay. Like I said, it's always readily available in your local, local supermarket. Okay. So using these fresh herbs is really an easy way to make things more flavorful without yes. having to add a lot of salt or sugar yes. or other types of things that maybe aren't as good for you to your diet, right? Yeah. That looks really good. And when the when the salmon is done, we can put it to the side for now. And we can go ahead and use the same pan to um, make our, with, with, with our spinach. So you got a bunch of fresh spinach here. The same pan, just put it straight in the pan. Season it with some um, celery salt. Then you got, you got some red wine over here and you can deglaze the spinach. You're doing what? Deglazing? Yeah, deglaze. Okay. <laughs> Basically, red wine helps, helps with flavor and it helps extract all the flavor from the fish to mainly the spinach. Okay, got it. And that is quick. That's done right there. Beautiful. Yeah, we didn't learn how to deglaze in nursing <laughs> school. Right. Now we can go ahead and plate up. Here it is. Get your balsamic reduction. Little spinach. So pretty. And there's salmon. And just top it off with the salsa. There you go. That's beautiful. Pansier, Atlantic salmon, boiled, tom boiled potato with wilted spinach, balsamic glaze reduction, and tomato salsa. Thank you so much, Chef Les, for, for demoing this for us. And I can't wait to try this at home. And I really think I'm not really a, a good um, cook. <laughs> <laughs> well, anybody can cook this at home. It's anybody? fairly simple. Anybody. You made it seem like it's all things that I could do. I mean, I have tomatoes and onions in my refrigerator. That's mm. something easy to grab. I have basil in my garden. But like you said, it's it's easy to get at your yeah. local supermarket. Yeah. Yeah. And then salmon. Easy also to get. Yeah. Easy to get. Readily available. Yeah. So I feel like this is such a easy meal. It didn't take a lot of ingredients. It didn't take a lot of time. I'm, I'm really excited to go home and try this. So thank you so much for, for demoing, this, yeah. demoing this for us today. <laughs> thank, thank you. you for, thank you for having me. So Chef Les did all the hard work for us and Kalamanu and I get to taste yeah. um, the delicious meal that he's made. This is our nutritionist from Kula Hospital, one of our nutritionists from Kula Hi. Hospital. <laughs> 
So, and we are unmasked because we're both vaccinated and we're outdoors. Mm -hmm. so cheers. cheers. Oh, that's really good. It has a nice crust. Really nice crust. <laughs> yep. And the vinaigrette has a lot of oh, flavor. Oh, I didn't try that. So we kind of talked about how using a vinaigrette sauce instead of a cream sauce is healthier. Can you, yeah. can you help me understand why? So a lot of cream sauces are really high in fat. So cream sauces usually have a lot of butter and they usually have like heavy whipping cream. So it's a really like a heavy dish. So having the balsamic vinegar kind of lightens the dish and there's also less fat in it. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. The spinach is really good too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so he does try to use a lot of fresh vegetables, um, like the salsa, he did use uh, fresh ingredients for the salsa. I think a lot of times people think of salsa, they think of the canned salsa for yeah. chips, um, which a lot of times have a lot of preservatives, or it's um, higher in salt. So you can make your own salsa at home, um, it just takes a couple ingredients, it's not too difficult, um, and you'll lower your salt content, a lot of times you can change the flavor you can make it more flavorful so I think that's the benefit of like scratch cooking what's uh, scratch what do you mean scratch, so scratch cooking? cooking like basically making food from scratch like using fresh whole ingredients okay so that's something that we try to do at Kula Hospital we try to do more scratch cooking when you have scratch cooking um, you kind of get to determine what exactly is in your food okay so like so first versus chef. going to a restaurant, you don't know exactly yeah, what's in there. Yeah, you don't know there. exactly what's in your food. Okay. Um, a lot of times people will buy processed foods because, I mean, it is simple to have processed foods, but as Chef has shown us, it can also be simple to have like but scratch cooked. But this looked really simple. Yeah. And full disclosure, I'm not, I'm not a great cook. I, I try, but mm -hmm. really the amount of ingredients that were in this yeah. dish was minimal, but the mm -hmm. taste is so flavorful. Yep. And that's what... I really enjoy about this and I want, really want people to understand is you don't have to have a lot of like salt and shoyu and, yeah, I and know. sugar and those types of things, mm -hmm. right? And full disclosure, I also don't really like tomatoes oh, and really? onions. <laughs> no, but together like this yeah. and with the lime and the salt and the pepper, yeah. this is something I could definitely do and I think yeah. that a lot of people would really enjoy this, mm -hmm. right? So thank you so much for yeah. joining us and, and tasting this with me and thank, thank you, you Chef Les for cooking this meal for us that we get to enjoy now. And um, thanks so much for, for all of your information and being here today. That was so much fun with Chef Leslie and Kalamanu. I hope you got excited to try out your own scratch cooking with fresh vegetables and herbs for flavor. You know, using fresh, fresh fruits and veggies in your cooking and diet not only tastes great, but can also help to lower your cholesterol. We'll talk more about that with Dr. Poon. The added flavor can also keep you from wanting to grab the salt shaker or shoyu bottle, which is helpful in keeping your blood pressure down if you're someone with high blood pressure. Now I would like to introduce you to someone who has been on a journey to change his diet and exercise habits after suffering multiple strokes in 2019. He's born and raised on Maui, but joining me via Zoom since he's currently working in Kona. This is Sean Suzuki. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. I'm really excited to have you share with us. In 2019, and after your first stroke, you woke up and your hand was numb and you're having difficulty using it. Did you really know at that point at all that you were having a stroke? No, actually I didn't. Um, I kind of was in shock. I thought it was a, a pinched nerve possibly. Right. Um, I, I never, stroke wasn't even on my mind. And so you had just recently been diagnosed with some some health conditions before the stroke, is that right? Right. I was diagnosed um, several months before with diabetes. And so at that time, did you even know that diabetes was a risk factor for stroke? I didn't. I did not know that. Um, you know, I just thought that diabetes is a common thing in Hawaii. I always hear family and friends have it, so I didn't like I didn't think anything of it. Right. And you were 32 years old, and I don't think that people realize that that people that young can have a stroke, right? And it's kind of so common that so many of, of our family members have diabetes and high blood pressure. And because mm -hmm. you had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. Yeah. So 
And, and I know Sean because we he joined our stroke support group. And so we've actually had some conversations before. And that's why I really want to invite him here because he's just, he has such great information. Um, and so I know that you had some disabilities after your stroke, right? Can you kind of, kind of share what that was like? Because you look great and healthy today. I can see your United States Postal Service shirt. So you're out in the community working now. What did you have to overcome to get there? So the third stroke was the, the major stroke that I had. Um, I lost I, my face drooped. Um, I lost my motion or mobility of my, my arm, my right arm. I had a hard time walking. Um, I couldn't talk properly. So that was basically what I was tasked with to, to try and over overcome. Um, so to overcome the, the ability to walk again, I would start walking around my house. It was a hard task just to make one lap around the house. Um, and that one lap around the house went down to the stop sign then went to a half a mile and increase to a mile up to six, seven miles. Wow. Yeah. So you really had to kind of push yourself to keep, keep going. So did you set right. goals? What was your motivation? Like, how did you, how did you do that? My biggest motivation is I'm stubborn. Um, <laughs> the doctor said that I don't think you'll get anything back. So, um, so right when I, right when I heard that, I was like, okay, I, I want to prove you wrong. Um, I, I'm I'm gonna take the challenge and I'm gonna not sit back and I'm, I'm gonna try and be proactive in this whole ordeal. There's really a whole mindset, right? Right, definitely, definitely. I know that you did other things too. So you did. I think you said you're not vegetarian anymore, but you you tried doing the Ornish diet. Um, right. Like, what changes to your diet did you have to make? Like. What what do you think led to your diabetes and how did you change that? So I, I would say sugar. Um, I, I'm a big sugar eater, ice cream, candy bars, soda. I can't stress enough how much soda I used to drink. Um, iced teas. So now basically I just drink water. Um, I don't crave sugar. I don't crave soda. And if I do, I try and do it in moderation. If, if I'm going to have a soda, I'll try and drink a diet soda. It's it to me. It's not any better, but I'm. If you're gonna cheat, I, I just try to cheat more smart, and I try to limit what my intake of my my. I guess if I want to eat bad or anything. So kind of by changing your habits, actually changed your cravings for you too as well. Yeah, you, know, you don't right. crave that stuff anymore, but you also don't hold back. You don't deprive yourself if you if right. you want something. But it's moderation, right? That's that's your key. Right. Yeah. Right. Definitely. And then, so I think I, I've also heard you talk about you're, you're big on helping community and family members, and you've kind of even reached out to, to others around you as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And help them change their habits. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I met several victims of stroke and I, I offered to whatever I can do to help. If you want to have a partner to walk with and to share, I'll, I'll walk with you, you know, um, now it's kind of hard because I, I work a lot, but I'm, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to, to kind of get that, that message across that you can live a healthier lifestyle. You can change. Don't just give up. Like we had people that had strokes. Don't, I don't want them to feel like they have a, like the victim mentality, like, okay, it happened. Let's work together and let's change your mindset and let's, uh, let's, I guess, get to wherever you're trying to go now together. I think it was really cool. You said that vic victim mindset and like you kind of shared in the past within our group, like you kind of would allow yourself to have that mindset for a little bit, be right. sad for a little bit and then pick yourself up and, and move forward. Right. Right. So basically I had, I, I basically gave myself 24 hours and I, I had the whole pity me mentality for 24 hours. And once that 24 hours is up, I don't want to hear anything negative about it. I don't want to cry. I don't want to see anything. Yeah. That's so awesome. That's, that is just a lot of determination. I think that's really cool. So, so last question for you. Um, 
what what kind of piece of advice can you give people who maybe have those risk factors now? Like, what, what do you want to share with them and how can they change their habits now? The biggest thing for me, I think, that I want to share is a, a little change does more than enough. I mean, just trying to do something to change will help dramat- um, dram- dramatically. Um, and yeah. Thank you, Sean, for talking. Thank you, Sean, for talking with me and sharing with our community your story. And I think it's so important that people know your story and know that strokes can happen at any age. And I think you're an inspiration to those around you and a testament to how having a positive outlook and determination can be so healing. You know, like I said, I first met Sean through our stroke support group, and he's been such an important member in keeping us motivated and determined. Um, If you've suffered a stroke or you're a caregiver for a stroke survivor, you can go to MauiHealth.org forward slash stroke for more information on how to join. So in talking with Sean, we heard how exercise and diet can positively affect your life. Movement and exercise are important after a stroke. And even more importantly, it can help prevent a stroke. So joining me now is Caitlin Reese. She's a physical Mm -hmm. therapist from Maui Memorial Medical Center. She's worked as a therapist for 12 years with a passion specifically for the neurologic population, patient population. She's worked in Atlanta, Seattle, and most recently moved from a spinal cord injury center in Denver, Colorado. Caitlin, thanks for joining us. We're so happy to have you here. We're so happy to have you on Maui. And so before we get started with our exercises, can you tell me a little bit about what our rehab department here at Maui Memorial does? Yeah, so we have physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. We'll work with you in the ED all the way through your stay in the hospital, and we help help you get back home or to rehab maybe at Kula. Um, We can train your family how to help you at home, help you get equipment. We have outpatient therapy and telehealth therapy now too. So a lot of great services to help our patients get back home and back to baseline. So now at this time, if you have your exercise bands, I'm going to invite Heha up to demo for us some new moves with Caitlin. Thank you. Oh, so sorry, Caitlin. I was drop off in front of the hospital. Excuse me, take off my mask. And I had to run all the way around the buildings, and my heart rate monitor is connected to my car, rental car, and it keeps going off on the alarm. If you can hear it in the background, I show apologies. So you want to hear it about every 60 seconds. So please, Caitlin, okay. I'm here for the people who's watching. Instead of having extra gravy tonight, we're going to have a little extra exercise to help so you out. Is that good? <laughs> That's great. And actually, since you're so tired, oh. why don't you sit down you. and you can oh. show us the seated exercises oh, and I'll do oh, the standing Lord, exercises. <laughs> so the first for our kupuna out there, for those of you who couldn't watch the Korean soap opera, just relax, <laughs> sit back, and then we're going to take you to yeah. a few exercises. Yeah, okay. don't relax too much. Go easy now. Yeah. Go easy. <laughs> okay. The first exercise is just sit to stand. Okay. So we're standing up, sitting down. Oh. What you can do is just a part, part one. Oh, okay, so, just, so I can engage my arm and my thigh. You got it. I got but I'm going to do the whole right. thing, all the way up and okay, down. So I Let's do you. ten. One. And if you want to make it harder, you can put one foot in front, and then oh. you're working your oh, back leg more. Oh, look at the variation. More. Look at, look yeah. at Auntie Caitlin over here. Huh? <laughs> She's doing a one-foot variant. <laughs> um, I think that's about 10. That's what 10 do you think? Up. And if you didn't do 10, nobody's watching. Nobody. You are going to have to be according to your own what you can do. Maybe it's only two. Maybe it's only three. <laughs> it's up to you. Okay, what else, Caitlin? We're going to put that band around Ooh, wow, just above okay. your wow. knees. Wow, while you're showing in a curve. I am. All right. So I'll show you the standing one while you're getting set up. Okay. So we're going to do a bit of a squat Got and some it. side steps. I might so go up do I do here. that sitting down? So you're going to keep your feet together. Yeah. And just ah, go out to the side. I remember this back yeah. in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> Trees Company, the lady used to do it like that. I remember you got that it. show. And if you want it harder, you can go oh. a deeper squat, but I'm not, no. I'm not trying to this do that. This is fine. This is fine. <laughs> 
That way I can still watch, you know, <laughs> Wheel of Fortune. I can do this all night long. You Very can. cool. That's pretty good. Now, this is the medium pen. Yeah, I Blue took the, is for medium. I took the lightest one. The yellow one's the hardest. The yellow is the hardest. Okay. You can take yours off. Okay. You're going to hook it around your foot. Oh, wow. Just one foot. I'm going fishing. Okay. <laughs> Like that? Yep, and you're going to bend your knee and push down. Yeah, so you're trying to activate your glute. And standing, oh. we're going to do that too. So Back, bend. yeah. Like huh? It's kind of like pump the brakes. Okay. Right. And pump if you're brakes. standing, then you're going to go back and out at a 45 degree angle. Trying to really activate Let's your pump glutes. the brakes right there. Yeah. <laughs> I pump and the brake, and you are going to pull away from the brake. It's yeah. true. And we're working on our balance too. And you can really switch. Important. Switch leg. We should switch legs. Yeah. I didn't switch legs for very long. Well, oh, I'm tired just doing this, and I'm sitting down, Katie. <laughs> wow. I've got to keep taking breaks too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one, it's the same seated or standing. Okay. We're going to switch to a couple exercises for your arms now. Might be hard with the mic. Okay. But I don't know. Um, so you're going to squeeze your elbows to your body. And we're going to push out. This is external rotation. All right. So we're using just small muscles in your shoulder blades. Oh, I feel it in my in shoulders. In your shoulders. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> I feel it in my back. Should I be using my back? Uh, yeah, you want to feel it right here. Yeah, I feel it right. Yeah, I yeah. feel it right there. That's the yeah. spot. Um, let's do a couple rows. Okay. We're both going to put under our foot. Okay. Yeah. And then I like to brace myself with my hand here. We're oh, gonna, all right. Yeah. This is good. Oh, okay. <laughs> and same thing here. You actually want to use your back. Good. Not. Wow. It's like, <laughs> it's yeah, like, it's like starting, starting a, the lawnmower. Uh, yeah, but a little more control, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, control. control. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. got it. I got it. I'm going to switch sides. Yeah, switch sides. Seems like a good idea. So, for those of you watching, this is simple, and you can still watch your program, watch your grandkids. Yeah, if you are recovering from a stroke, this is very easy, easy going, yeah? <laughs> As you get back to the normal. See, I'm breathing heavy already. This is not easy. <laughs> it's not yeah, easy. It's hard, even though I'm sitting here yeah. standing. Okay. This last one is one of my favorites. About building more stability in your shoulders. Okay. Um, I call it wall clocks. It's best if you can put your hands up against a wall, which we don't really have. All right. And you're going to think about bringing your hand up to 2 o'clock, then wow. 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. Now, where was this exercise <laughs> when I had a calcification in my shoulder? I don't know. Because but I couldn't even do this yeah. <laughs> on a clock. Oh, wow. Get so it. two, three, four. Yeah, let's do it together. We can okay. have a very and gentle. We call this the short three, TikTok. Four. All right. Wow. Ten. Reinforcing that Dude. time theme. Eight. Eight. Yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here we go. Be fast. Here we go. Be fast. Here we go. Be fast. Oh, no. Okay, yeah, then yeah. getting into it. Be fast. Here we go. Be fast. Be fast. Oh, thank you so much, Kaylin. I had a lot of fun. Be fast. Be fast. Here we go. Are we going on? Here we go. Wipe the, the mic. Wipe the mic. Wipe the mic. Wipe the mic. Wipe the mic. Be fast. 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 Regain functionality and strength. When I was in Kula to visit Chef Les, I also stopped by their rehab department to learn a little bit more about what they offer at the Kula Hospital Rehabilitation Program. Their rehab program includes both short-term rehab and long-term rehab services. And they were able to show me some of the equipment they use. Here's Taylor and Mike to tell us more. Aloha, I am Taylor Smith, Occupational Therapist and Rehab Supervisor at Kula Hospital. Aloha, my name is Mike. I'm a Physical Therapist at Kula Hospital. As an Occupational Therapist, we work on improving your independence towards your activities of daily living. That's your dressing, bathing, toileting, grooming, cooking. As a Physical Therapist, we provide strength training, balance training, and other interventions aimed at maximizing functional independence and improving our patient's ability to walk. Our speech therapy team addresses deficits from language, speech, cognition, and swallow. 
Ultimately, our goal is to limit or reduce chronic disability so that our patients may return to the community. You guys play such an important role in getting people back to their normal daily lives and we have things like this contraption here. You want to tell me about yeah, it? Yeah, this is a, a Riften Tram Gait Assist. Uh, it's basically a body weight supporting, uh, it's a mobile body weight support system. Uh, unlike body weight support treadmill training or if you've heard of the Alter G, this supports the person's weight often with a pelvic harness and allows them to walk. So you can retrain somebody's muscles, help them make that body-mind connection again, help right. them to be ambulatory. Right. This takes their takes however much body weight we want to take away from them so that they can move their weak leg or a therapist can be down here helping them with their weak leg. And that's awesome that we have this available right here in yeah. Kula Maui. So after a stroke, people can have pain, they can have um, the need to retrain muscles. And so there's another really cool piece of equipment that they have up here at Kula. Mike, tell me a little bit about it because I've never seen this one before. Sure, this machine has uh, multiple functions. Um, it has ultrasound for some of those painful or tight muscles that mm -hmm. you were talking about, Mariah. Uh, ultrasound's kind of like a deep heat. Uh, it also has electrical stimulation. Sometimes what we need to do as therapists with people with stroke is um, retrain the muscles and sometimes those muscles need a little bit of extra to sort of wake them up. So we would uh, apply the electrodes and it's a mild electric current to try to kind of get jump start the muscle. Very cool. So really good piece of equipment. Thank you. So I'm really so grateful to have been able to come up here and talk with Taylor and Mike today about the awesome rehab services that are available here at Kula Hospital. So I hope you guys learned something new today. I know that I did. So thank you guys so much for having me. Three, two. It really takes a team of people to help someone get back on track after having a stroke. I'm so grateful we have such great people on Maui that are available to our community. Speaking of great people, joining me now is Dr. Kimball Poon. Dr. Poon is a graduate of Harvard University and attended Cornell Medical School in New York. He completed his residency at UCLA Medical Center where he met his wife, Dr. Shimizu. Thankfully, she's a local girl from Oahu and we're so lucky that she wanted to return to the best place ever and came back to her home state with Dr. Poon to work here on Maui. Dr. Poon is originally from Atlanta, Georgia and his southern hospitality has now transformed into Aloha Spirit. I think he truly embodies this in the way that he cares for his patients and his colleagues. Thanks so much, Dr. Poon, for being here. Thanks for that really nice introduction. <laughs> You're very welcome. So I asked you to uh, tell, tell us first a little bit about um, what type of patients you see, what you do. Sure, so I'm a cardiologist, so I'm a heart specialist. And patients that see a cardiologist generally have one of three problems. If they have blocked arteries, so that's stents, bypass surgery, or angina. Sometimes patients have problems with the muscle or the valves, and that's heart failure. And then other patients have problems with uh, irregular heart rhythm, so that would be atrial fibrillation, pacemakers, um, those types of issues. And since many patients that see cardiologists uh, either have had a stroke or at high risk for a stroke, we often see patients um, with this disorder. Yeah, and so because you're so kind of so close to stroke, that's why I did ask you to come. That and that he'll wear a bow tie anytime you request it, which I think is great. And so, but I didn't know when I first asked you to talk that stroke was actually really close to your heart. And can you share with everybody why? Sure. Really, the 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 main reason I care so much about stroke prevention and really why I'm here uh, tonight is that this disorder has really impacted. Um, my life. Uh, six years ago, my dad had a really, really bad stroke. Um, he worked his whole life. He was just, uh, he's, he, when he finally retired, he did everything the doctors told him. He controlled his sugars, his blood pressure was good, he exercised, um, and he even his stroke happened while he was at the gym. Um, it, it was a really bad stroke. Um, I watched him go through the hospital a wheelchair, a walker, fine with a cane. I just, I never want to see someone go through what my mom and dad went through. And that's why it's just so important that when there are things that can be done to prevent a stroke, like Dr. Juan talked about, I just, 
I really encourage the patients, and I, I'm very honest. I tell them the story. I've had many patients say, "Ah, uh, yeah, I don't feel like taking the medicine." Right. I say, "You know, listen. You know, this is my personal story, and so that's why that's really why I'm here tonight." Yeah, thank you, and I'm so glad to hear your dad's doing better. And so we know that one of the highest risk factors for a stroke is high blood pressure. And so, how does high blood pressure? cause a stroke? Great, that's, that's a really important point. So high blood pressure or hypertension, um, as Dr. Wan mentioned, is really the biggest risk factor that can be prevented. It increases your risk for a stroke by three or four fold. That's a lot. Um, in, in the way it, it causes a stroke is that it increases the pressure in the arteries. And so there are arteries that run in your neck, in your heart, through your belly, in your legs. Um, Imagine a garden hose and you've just cranked up the pressure like my kids will do and just blast it up. Mm -hmm. If you let it sit like that for hours or days or years, it shouldn't be a surprise if the inner lining of the hose gets damaged and right. so the hose may burst. And that's really what high blood pressure does to the vessels in your head. It can cause uh, damage to the lining and then bad things can happen. Now, really importantly, if you treat your blood pressure, your risk for a stroke goes down by 30 or 40 percent. Um, but because high blood pressure, you often can't feel it, people either forget or they choose not to treat it. And that's the real difficulty. Um, and because so many people have hypertension, it's, it's just real important, as Dr. Wan's saying, get your blood pressure checked regularly and make sure you get it on your goal, which for most patients is 130. Right. That's a good, good number to know and a good reminder that you should be checking your blood pressure. And then another heart disease that can cause stroke is atrial fibrillation. And how does this transform into a stroke? Great, so uh, that's a really important question. I'm glad you asked. So atrial fibrillation is a type of irregular heart rhythm. And what happens is when you have this irregular heart rhythm, blood clots can form in the, in the heart. And if they escape the heart and then go to the brain. And so patients that have AFib are really at a five-fold uh, higher risk for a stroke. And when patients with AFib have strokes, these are the the big devastating kind. Yeah. These are the real, the real heavy hitters. Now the good news is there are medicines that reduce that stroke risk, and so the anticoagulants like Pradaxa, Eliquis, Xarelto, or Warfarin, they reduce your stroke risk by seventy percent. But because so many people just hear the word blood thinner, um, they they focus on the risk and the downside, and right. they don't see the upshot. You know, it's seventy percent reduction of a stroke risk. Yeah, that's a big number. And then so one, another cardiac disease or heart disease um, is, or that can, be, can cause heart disease is high cholesterol. And how is this with stroke? How does high cholesterol cause a stroke? Sure, so uh, cholesterol damages the blood vessels very much uh, in the same way high blood pressure does. You've got blood vessels all throughout your body, and if you have high cholesterol, it can deposit inside the vessels, cause irritation, and then you can bleed in those vessels, or mm -hmm. the vessels can tear or, um, or, or break open entirely. Mm -hmm. And now, there are medicines that treat high cholesterol, so not everyone needs to be on a statin, but patients that we consider to be high risk, um, statins reduce that stroke risk by 20 or 30 percent, and again, when patients are at high risk and they feel like, ah, I don't want to take the medicine, I say, listen, you know, strokes are just, they're really severe and can, right. can change your life. Right. So a 20, 20 to 30 percent reduction with statin, I mean, that's, that's, that's big. So really important to take your medication. So thank you for sharing your dad and his story with us. It really shows how stroke can hit close to home for anybody. In just a moment, we're going to invite Dr. Juan and Caitlin back for our live Q&A. If you have any questions or would like to know more about the topics they shared, just type your question into the chat and our panel will do their best to answer. We've already got some questions that have come in, so I already have those next to me, but go ahead and add your questions if you want to. Before I bring them up, I would like to say thank you again for joining us for the fifth annual Stroke Awareness Fair. I'd like to thank our guest speakers that have contributed to this event. Thank you Alzheimer's Association, American Heart Association, and the Hawaii Stroke Coalition for adding to our mailers that went out to the pre-registered participants. If you'd like the exercise bands and the information we shared, you can go to MauiHealth.org and register to receive the packet while supplies last. So thank you to Maui Health for your support and to Akaku for helping us reach out to our community. So. Let's see what questions you folks asked. Um, 
Let's see. We have we have one for Dr. Wong, but since you're sitting here, Dr. Poon, um, one of the questions is, what number should my cholesterol be? Uh -huh. that's that's a really um, that's a really good question, a very insightful one. Um, so the target cholesterol it really depends on the person. It's just like asking, you know, how much food should I be eating? Okay. So um, a college athlete is going to eat a lot more calories than a middle-aged cardiologist that sits at a desk all day. So the same thing with your cholesterol. If you're at very low risk for a stroke, we're willing to tolerate higher cholesterol levels. Okay. But if we consider you to be at very high risk, then we will aim for lower numbers. So it really depends on each patient's risk risk profile for a stroke, and that's what determines what we consider to be high or not. So another good reason to really work with your physician. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Dr. Poon. Um, next question is going to be for Dr. Wan. And this question is, my mom had a stroke in her 80s. Does that mean I'm more at risk for a stroke? Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, there are some very rare um, syndromes where uh, stro uh, the, those diseases are passed on genetically okay. um, and, and people generations after generations have um, increased risk for stroke. But generally those are identified pretty early in life and the people will have a stroke early in their life before age 50. And so when we see people who have strokes younger and have no risk factors, that's when we really look for these kind of genetic disorders. But if it's a, a patient in their 80s and, you know, they have the risk factors that we talk about, then it's very unlikely that is that genetic disorder causing the stroke and very unlikely for that to be passed down to, to the future generations. That's, yeah. that's a lot of great information. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, we have another question for Caitlin. Thank you, Dr. Wan. And again, don't forget to, to put your questions in the chat if you have one. Okay, this is, I don't have exercise bands. Are there other exercises you can suggest? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is just getting moving. So anything that you like to do, um, it can be walking or dancing, or you can tie it into your normal activities, those sit-to-stands. You can do that while you're watching TV or... I'm watching your kid do homework. Um, but I mean, you really would probably suggest the, the TikTok wall clock. <laughs> I mean, but if you don't have that, that's fine. Yeah. So what you can do is just incorporate lots of movement, movement throughout your day. Yeah, and I feel like Fitbits and Apple Watches and the little heart yeah. health app on your iPhone, tracking steps is great because it tracks more than just your steps. Yep, and that's a good movement. one. And it's good to get into a competition. We're at a competition here. Movers and shakers, I want to see you doing more steps. <laughs> so the whole hospital is now in a step competition. So that's a great way to get moving, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, another question for Dr. Wan. If you've had a stroke, are you more likely to have a second or another stroke? Mm -mm. A little question, but um, I think the short answer would be yes. Um, you know, people who've had strokes or clearly have some kind of risk factor for stroke. Um, does that necessarily mean you will have another stroke? No, I mean, it really, having a first stroke is really a, basically a, a big warning sign. Hey, now it's time to really look at your risk factors. What are some of the medications you should be on? What are the lifestyle changes that should be yeah. done? And so, yes, there is a risk for second stroke, but it doesn't necessarily that will mean that that will happen, especially if you really start paying attention to the things that can be done to prevent a second stroke. And it just can be a really big wake-up call, like we saw with Sean, right? He had his strokes and then made the changes, and he's on a good road to prevention for future strokes, right? Yeah, right? it sounds like he's recovering really well, actually. Yeah, yeah he's doing great. Okay, we have a question for Dr. Poon. Um, besides medicine, what are there other ways, what other ways can I lower my blood pressure? Okay, so, wow, that, that's a really good question because we shouldn't always assume that medicines are, are the first or even the best option. Really, exercise is probably the best blood pressure medicine out there. You lower your pressure and you feel great. So certainly exercise and the current recommendation is 30 minutes, five days a week of moderate exercise. Okay. So moderate exercise means breaking a sweat. I have a lot of patients say, oh yeah, you know, I clean around the house. That's good. That's a good start. But it needs to be moderate exercise, breaking a sweat. So 
um, exercise is, is a big one, watching your salt. Okay. No one knows for sure where the, the goal is, but probably somewhere between two to three grams of sodium a day okay. uh, is important. Also, um, making sure that you uh, don't drink too much, probably one or two drinks a day above that is going to raise your blood pressure. And there are also certain medications. If you're just pounding the Aleve yeah. and the Advil, that can also raise your blood pressure. And also stress. Yeah. You know, gosh, I mean, stress is bad for so many parts of your body. But, you know, taking time to take care of yourself uh, and your family and trying to find that happy space is really important. Got it. Thank you so much. Do we have time for more questions? Let's see. So I think Dr. Wan can take this one again. Maybe another loaded question. Oh. <laughs> Do strokes cause permanent damage? Okay. Um, Scott, yes and no. You know, um, once an area of the brain has a stroke, the injury is there. Um, but there's something called neuroplasticity where basically the healthy brain around that stroke will rewire itself to relearn that function that's been lost. So although um, physically the damage is there, um, functionally people can get better and regain whatever that is that's lost, just like we've seen with Sean. Yeah. Right. So even though he, you know, he had very severe deficits, it sounds like with his speech and with right-sided weakness, over time um, the brain was able to relearn all that and compensate. And so, if we were to do, you know, a picture of his brain today, we might still see the stroke, the actual, you know, physical evidence that is there. But if you look at him, we might never know because he was able to regain all that function. Right. Yeah. He was very determined and, yeah. and did his rehab. He's worked close with his physician, so a lot of important points there. Mm -hmm. And then while I still have you th here, well, I have one question, but I think sure. the next one's going to be for you as well. Um, but we did have a question about: Do you have does does Maui Health have a stroke support group? And, and we do, and like I said, you can go to MauiHealth.org forward slash stroke and to get more information for that. And actually, I think we are out of time, so okay. thank you so much. You're thank welcome. you so much to all of our participants this evening. I really appreciate, appreciate you being here. Um, when you look back at the video, maybe follow Caitlin instead of hey-ha, but it's your choice. So remember to work closely with your physician and reach out to them if you have any questions and also remember to be fast. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mariah.